Take it away, Lee. Um, hi, we're the Gorilla Lit Reading Series. Um, this is our virtual edition. Um, I think this is the third one. And they've all gone pretty well. So we'll continue it as long as this goes for. Um, and tonight we got three great readers. Uh, we have Nicole Mabry, Farouk Ahmed, and Peter Klein. Um, so let's get right to it. Nobody needs to hear me talk anymore. Uh, Dixon Place's literary programs are generously supported by the Axe Houghton Foundation and the NYC Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, we'd be so grateful if you consider making a donation to keep the literary fires burning at Dixon Place. Um, the full link is in your chat. Um, and then what we'll also do is at the end of uh, all three readers, uh, we'll open up the chat. And if anybody has any questions or comments to the readers or just about writing and books in general, um, we'll open that up. So if you want to kind of type out your questions and then I'll go through them afterwards and or just speak freely. Uh, and then other than that, let's let's get right to it. So our first reader, uh, Nicole Mabry. Nicole, am I pronouncing your last name right? Mabry? Uh, close. It's Mabry. Mabry. Okay. Nicole Mabry grew up in Northern California, but has lived in Queens for the past 17 years. She went to college at UCLA and Cal State Hayward, graduating with degrees in art history, photography, and digital graphics. She currently works for NBC Universal, managing photography post-production for Bravo, Sci-Fi, and the USA Network. Her award-winning photography has graced the covers of books internationally and has been featured in shows throughout the city. After a successful 20-year career in photography, she decided to take a left turn and go from telling a story with an image to telling a story with words. Nicole's debut novel, an apocalyptic women's fiction thriller, was inspired by the dream she had when a real-life snowstorm shut down all forms of public transportation in the city. And we can, you know, relate now. Um, past this point tells the story of one woman and her dog fighting to survive during a deadly out a virus outbreak that renders New York City a ghost town. Um, please welcome Nicole. Hi, everyone. Um, so yes, I wrote a book about a deadly flu epidemic that came out just a few months ago, which is unfortunate or fortunate de timing, depending on how you look at it. Um, usually I read a passage about the virus and the impending quarantine, but at this point, I feel like we all know what that looks like and are probably sick of hearing about it. Uh, so instead, I've decided to read an action scene that we can hopefully escape into and gives us a win. Um, my main character, Karis, has been quarantined to her apartment for over a month. Uninfected residents have been evacuated out of New York City, but Karis didn't make it out. Um, the only people that she interacts with are two young girls living across the courtyard from her. Uh, their mother has died and she has been taking care of them from afar and has developed uh, maternal instincts towards them. So in this scene, Karis has spotted two men breaking into buildings, attacking people and stealing their supplies. The men go for the girls' building and Karis decides to climb over their attached roofs and save the girls from these dangerous men. I ran back to my dining room looking for anything I could use as a weapon. I considered kitchen knives or the hammer from my toolbox. If they got their hands on me, I would be done. My only advantage was that I was small and fast. I needed something I could use from a distance. My eyes fell to the crowbar, the only thing that remotely fit the bill. I snatched it up and ran to the stairs. Before I went up, I looked out the hallway window again. I couldn't see the girls anymore, but I saw movement through the first floor window from their building. Damn it, they're inside. I had to go. I ran up to the roof and hopped up onto the ledge. Hoisting myself up, I threw the crowbar over, then followed it. I tiptoed slowly down the stairs in their building, trying to discern what floor the men were on. There were more than 20 apartments in the building, and it was likely they were still working their way through the first floor. The girls were up on five, so I had some time. As I neared the landing for the second floor, the faint sounds of the men's conversation floated up. I peeked around the corner, but only saw empty apartments through the open doors on the fl first floor. I stood flat against the wall near the entrance to the stairs, clutching the crowbar. As I turned my head to check the other direction, I caught my reflection in a large oval, oval mirror across from me. I jumped at the wide eyes looking back at me. This isn't going to work. They'll be able to see me. I watched the mirror, monitoring their movements. Sharp clinks of cans echoed off the walls as they dropped their stolen goods on the ground near the vestibule doors. 
I caught a glimpse of them as they walked to the stairs and I immediately dropped down into a crouch, holding a crowbar like a baseball bat. Their steps neared as they guffawed to one another, making jokes about the people they were stealing from. Adrenaline shot through me and my arms started to shake uncontrollably. Damn it, I had to get a hold of myself. I took two deep breaths and saw a booted foot land on the top step next to me. Without thinking, I let my last breath go and swung as hard as I could, but I didn't stop. I pulled back and struck two more times. I heard a man scream and his body fell against the stairwell wall. I stood up and in the mirror locked eyes with the second skinnier man. In that look, I saw shock that quickly turned into rage. My, adre my adrenaline was an asset as I turned and ran down the hall, trying doors. The first few were locked, but the third knob turned and I rushed into a dark kitchen. Charlie, damn it, stop helping me and go get her, the injured man barked. Let me just pull you up to the next floor. Don't worry, I'll find her. She's trapped in here. I turned toward the front door and saw it, saw it creeping open. Oh no, I didn't close it all the way. Then I noticed a closet door on the opposite wall slightly ajar. I could just make out two eyes looking back at me and the faint clings of a face. There's someone else here. The closet door closed with a light click. The men were still arguing. I peeked out the doorway. Charlie was trying to drag Tony up the stairs against his will. They were too close. If I closed and locked the front door, they would hear it and, I, and know where I was. I looked around the kitchen until I saw an old fashioned round kitchen timer. Charlie, go get that girl now. I set the alarm for 20 seconds and threw it out the door and down the hall. It clanked to the ground. It didn't go as far as I had hoped, but I would make do. Did you hear that? Leave me alone, go. I kept watching through the slit in the door. Char Charlie finally gave up and climbed up the last steps to the second floor. His eyes immediately went to the cracked door and he walked towards it. Why hasn't the timer gone off? It feels like full minutes have passed. Sweat slid down the groove in my back and the tension in my body was almost painful. He reached up an arm and was about to push the door open when the alarm sounded. His head jerked to the side as he tried to decide what it was and what to do. He turned and walked toward the timer. When he bent down to pick it up, I took my chance and darted out the door. I was already around him and close to the stairs when he saw me. I rushed up the stairs and almost made it to the third floor when I felt the tug on the crowbar still in my hand. I tightened my grip, determined to hang on to my only weapon. But he tugged harder and spun me around, pulling the crowbar from my hand. It hit the marble stairs and clattered down. I saw his fist flying toward my face right before he punched me, throwing me into the metal railing. I saw stars and my vision blurred while my head thumped in pain. I heard a snap and felt the old iron railing give as my body sagged over the edge. The top bar of the railing had come loose and the exposed rods dug into my back. Charlie clamped his hands around my throat and squeezed, pushing me forcefully onto the broken railing rods. I breathed in spurts as I choked. Drops of Charlie's spit fell onto my cheeks. You made a big mistake messing with Tony like that. He's going to make you suffer now, he threatened through cigarette-stained teeth. His hair was so greasy it was sticking to his forehead. I could barely breathe and I saw dark fuzzy edges in my vision. I pulled futilely at his arms, trying to lessen the pressure on my throat, sure that my eyes were bulging out of their sockets. Then everything began moving slowly and I thought about my dad teaching me self-defense in preparation for my move to the big bad city. He told me, always go for the groan, groin first, throat second. That's all I'd need to get away. I pulled my foot off the floor, bent my knee, and slid my leg back. I focused all my energy on that leg and let it fly. My knee caught him in the, in the testicles, and I felt his hand release me. His red face came down to my level as he stumbled back, bending down to grab his groin. His bloodshot blue eyes widened in shock. I didn't even take in a much-needed breath before I pulled my arm back and punched him in the throat. He fell to the ground, gasping, with one hand on his groin and the other on his throat. My own throat burned as I finally choked in several gulps of air. I ran up the last step onto the third floor and saw the door ajar at apartment 3B. I raced through it and straight to the kitchen, looking for a knife, but I couldn't find a knife rack or a butcher block. Charlie coughed and yelled that he was coming for me. There was a bottle of vegetable oil on the counter and my wheels started spinning. I could hear him grunting up the last two steps. I didn't have time to search for something better without making noise, so I grabbed the bottle and tiptoed behind the slightly open front door. Quietly, I opened the bottle of oil and put the cap in my pocket. 
My heartbeat was so loud in my ears that I was afraid he would hear it too. I filled my lungs with air and held my breath. The door opened wider as his body came into view. Oh girl, you are in for it now. I was gonna let Tony have the pleasure, but now, now you're gonna get us both. He laughed evilly as he moved farther into the living room, hunched over and limping. I heard St Tony staggering up the steps. Charlie, did you get her? Tell me you got her. Not yet, but I will. She's here, I can smell her. I didn't have much time. Once Tony arrived, I would be outnumbered. When Charlie was looking behind the couch, I slid silently around the door, my eyes never leaving his shape. Just as I reached the open doorway, I couldn't hold my breath any longer, so I let it out. Charlie turned and sneered at me. I made a dash for the stairs, dropped my arm, and let the oil flow behind me. It sounded like he was right on top of me. I grabbed the, the railing leading to the fourth floor as I heard him slip and scream. I turned just in time to see him slide forward on the oil. He waved his arms, attempting to regain his balance, his feet desperately trying to gain purchase. He looked at me, at me his eyes wide and frantic. His arms shot towards me as he tried to steady himself, but I took a step back and his feet, his feet lost the battle as he fell down onto the broken railing. His face landed directly onto an exposed rod and I heard a squishing sound as the rod came out the other side of his head. I gasped and put my hands over my mouth to stifle a scream. Horror jolted through me. My body felt electrified and rigid. I took another step back, trying to distance myself from the scene, my eyes wide open in shock and my breath coming out in hard puffs. Tony rounded the corner and appeared at the bottom of the steps. When he saw Charlie, his face turned bright red and he looked up at me. What did you do? I'll kill you. His fists were clenched in his eyes. I'd never seen anything like those eyes. They looked demonic. I shook my head trying to deny what I'd done, but Tony started pulling himself up the stairs. I was frozen in place, my feet unable to move. When Tony was halfway up, an inner voice screamed, run. I regained my wits and dashed up the stairs. Even though he was limping, I heard him not far behind me. I ran all the way up to the roof and threw the door open. I looked toward my apartment, debating about what to do. I could run back to my apartment to lure him away from the girls, but I have no weapons and he's much bigger and stronger. I imagined him cornering me in an apartment, beating me, choking me the way Charlie had, or worse. I touched my neck. Best case scenario, he'll kill me quickly. No, I can't take him one-on-one. -on -one. I looked to the right. The next building over was the grocery store. Can I survive a two-story drop? I searched the roof, hoping to spot the ladder that led down to the fire escape, but it wasn't there. I jumped when Tony called to me from the landing below. He was too close and climbing the stairs quickly. I was out of time. I acted on instinct and sprinted toward the grocery store. I knew there was about an eight foot gap between the buildings. So when my foot hit the edge, I launched myself. I flew through the air, terrified. When I hit the roof, my knees came up to my chest. My right foot wobbled to the side and pain shot up my ankle, but I managed to push my legs up straight to counter the impact. I pitched forward and landed on my shoulder as I tucked and rolled. My shoulder explode, exploded in pain and I heard a pop. When my body stopped rolling, I turned to look behind me. A second later, Tony jumped off the building, but he hadn't launched like I had. He didn't know about the gap. He screamed as he fell through the air. His knees weren't tucked and he landed straight-legged. His left leg landed solidly on the roof, but his right leg, the one I'd smashed with the crowbar, landed on the edge, half on and half off. His legs buckled and his body wobbled to the right, his arms pinwheeling as he tried to pull his body back up. He looked at me and there was a moment of surrender in his eyes. His body relaxed, giving up the fight, and he fell over the edge. I screamed and heard a loud thump followed by a flap. I pulled myself up and ran to the edge, holding my arm to the side. I looked over the edge. His body was lying face down on the cement next to a large garbage bin, his, his legs bent at a sickening angle. I watched to see if he moved, but I didn't know which I was hoping for, dead or alive. Then I saw a movement, but it wasn't from Tony. A pool of dark red blood was fanning around his head. I squeezed my eyes shut and sat back on my heels, crying in anger and frustration. I stood up and noticed that my tingling arm was dangling. I must have dislocated my shoulder. I couldn't move it at all. I lay down on the roof, closed my eyes, and tried to calm down, attempting to block out what I'd just seen and what I'd just done. I thought about the girls laughing and playing, about the dance they performed for me one night to some Disney song. I thought about my mom and dad, about the time they took me to Mexico for my college graduation present. We'd gone on a boat cruise and danced on the upper deck to a live mariachi band. 
A few minutes later, I myself up. I walked over to the edge where Tony was, where the metal railing from the ladder curved down over the edge. The ladder didn't go all the way to the ground, so I would have to drop the last several feet on one arm and a probably sprained ankle. But that wasn't what was bothering me. The pool of blood was making its way directly under the ladder. I climbed down with my one good arm, using my chin to hold the rungs intermittently. When I got to the bottom, I looked down, and I knew there was no way around it. I was going to land in the blood. I took a deep breath, relaxed my body, and jumped off the ladder. When I hit the ground, I heard a wet smack, and my ankle screamed in protest. My breath pushed out of me, and I felt nauseous from the pain. My vision blurred while I tried to pull in air. After a minute, I walked around Tony's body and noticed a bloody bubble pushing in and out of his mouth. I heard a strange wheezing and realized he wasn't dead yet. His eyes were open, open, watching the blood seep from his body. Fear spiked through me and I remembered every horror movie scene where the attacker suddenly comes to life and grabs the main character who wrongly assumed he was dead. I quickly jumped back and leaned against the opposite wall, watching that bloody bubble fill and deflate until it finally stopped. I limped toward the street, leaving bloody footprints in my wake. Thank you, Nicole. Um, that was great. Super action packed. Uh, yeah, I liked it. Um, <laughs> all right, our next reader uh, for the night is um, Farouk Ahmed. He was raised in the great state of Kansas and is the graduate of the Columbia University Writing Program and of Brown University, where he studied biochemistry. He's a contributing editor for Photonics Magazine, and his writing has appeared in the Financial Times, Nature, and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. His work has been lauded by the South Asian Journalists Association, and he lives in Los Angeles. Kansas Stan is his debut novel. Please welcome Farouk. Thank you, Nicole. That was so reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have like nightmares of that blood bubble, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my horror movie uh, obsession came out there. I don't know if uh, you guys have been doing this, but I think ever since this like pandemic isolation began, I've been binge watching a lot of like really disturbing content to make myself feel better. I don't know, just to get my heart rate up, something like that. So, anyways, um, thank you, uh, Marco, Lee, Gorilla Lit, and Dixon Place for uh, making this happen. Um, I am so bummed that uh, this, you know, is happening under these circumstances because I was lo really looking forward to being in New York like this week and hanging out. And I lived in New York for a long time. So I really appreciate what you guys, uh, both at Gorilla Lit and Dixon Place are doing. I know, I think I have some folks on this uh, chat from New York. So shout out to you guys. Hope you're staying safe. Hope to see you soon. Um, also, um, this is gonna be a weird segue, but uh, I practiced it and there's no other way to do this, uh, which is to first say RIP to George Floyd and to all of those who have um, suffered at the hands of white supremacist violence in the U.S. And um, again, not to make this sound strange or glib, but um, uh, so my novel Kansastan was out um, in the fall uh, of last year, and um, it's uh, inspired by the American Civil War, which is probably the you know, greatest instance of white supremacist violence in the U.S. Um, and uh, Kansastan is uh, what I like to call fake historical fiction, um, which is to say that it's inspired by the American Civil War, but um, what I've sort of done is taken a group of Muslims who are um, sort of defending themselves against the uh, Missouri terrorists who are uh, trying to invade and conquer um, the land, uh, Kansas land. It's uh, the narrator of the story uh, tries to um, uh, rouse the Kansans, but, but can't seem to do it. Um, until his cousin comes, and his cousin is um, sort of hailed as the savior of the state. He is seen as kind of the next Muslim prophet. And um, uh, the part that I'm going to read um, is a little bit action-packed, probably not as action-packed as Nicole was, Nicole's reading was, um, but in it, uh, the narrator's cousins, a group known as the brothers, uh, the followers of the, of the, the cousin, basically believe that the narrator has killed the um, prophet, uh, killed his cousin. 
And so the narrator is now fleeing uh, the mosque that he lived in um, and trying to escape uh, into Colorado to save himself. Um, if that doesn't make sense, um, I don't blame you. But, you know, pick up the book. Maybe it'll make more sense. Maybe. Uh, this uh, chapter is titled Pastor Garrett's Boots. And I need mean, this. Between the mistrust of vindictive brothers, the disregard of my person by my aunt, and the increasing innovations of the imam to our worship, I had to quit the mosque. An urchin was forced to flee his home such that it was, leave his love and his nascent son, and attempt to cross a border, to tramp onto a foreign soil, to resign, to reassign himself to the mercy of the Coloradans. Would that I had made it to the summit of a great peak where country relents and transforms into heavens, the Lord be praised. The brothers, they besieged me. I was not certain why, other than that they perceived me as a threat to their order, their fealty to the imams and my cousins' innovations to our practices. The brother and darkened lenses mostly admitted to me one night. But imagine that. My humble, and my humble form, the source of their consternation. The brothers sent tenderfoots in droves to shadow my sure steps. The little menaces, their numbers unceasing, sprung from behind the mosque's walls, beneath coffee house tables, and from around the well when I fetched water. They ascended the innumerable steps of my tower and ransacked my chambers to harry and to harass. In truth, they absconded with a rat's harvest, but they gouged a blade into my deer skull and split it in half. These brothers, as they had threatened to do with the few non-brothers, non-partisans, and non-believers who refused to leave the good land on which they were raised and immigrate into loathed Missouri, false Arkansas, dust-ridden Oklahoma, or another uninhabitable land, these brothers would press for my tongue after leaving my body from the sweet burden of my head. I was no soothsayer, but of, but of this I had become certain. My final night as a civilian in the mosque, while supplicants supplicated, I readied for my departure. On a pallet, I laid out the trappings, bladders of well water, goat turkey, hardtack, oat cake, tobacco and papers, a matchbox, a map, pure white tunics, the kind favored by the brothers themselves, for I know the meaning of the word subterfuge and it is conformity, and a blade that I had excised from the deer skull. I bundled these provisions into a gale blanket and lashed it to a branch of willow. Over the years, I have become adept at only a few things, most of them custodial or sanguinary in nature, but I can deftly denude branches of willow leaves. I set the pack on a grit floor and hoisted onto my lap my aunt's treasured and illuminated holy book on a foray into the imam's office for the letter marked Kansas Urchin Department that had delivered me to this bereft and inhospitable place. I had found and appropriated her prized possession. The book had a reassuring heft, all significant works announced as such by their carriage, and I parted the pages. Words that attested to the might of the Almighty were forged in a faded gold ink beneath the gory images. Or so I surmised, from what I had learned in the mosque, I knew at least that the Lord needed attesting to, for he is the one who deserves to be praised. The page that had been torn by the shepherd's son fell from the book and slipped into my grasp. In it, Abraham dutifully pressed his scythe into Ishmael's neck. It retained creases from my aunt's travels, and I refolded it and tucked the page into my tunic. It sorrowed me that I could not bring the meaty book on my journey. Perhaps it would find my way back to my aunt, I thought. Evening came bruising through the sky, and with my Jupiter finger, I traced the setting sun. It was the first prayer I had missed since my cousin's ascension. It did seem appropriate enough an occasion. The worshipful minions caromed out of the mosque herded their ticklish brood, nodded solemnly to my aunt. Several must have said deferential, neighborly words to her and her companions, and then settled into the tents, shacks, shanties, and other hastily built shelters that sufficed for their dirt floored homes. Would that I had set flame to that village when I had a chance. With this group, my love, Miss A, emerged from the mosque. I thought that this would be my last chance to see her, and so I committed my mind to chronicling her movements with the vigor of those spies sent to shadow me. She was dressed in white like my aunt, and belly protruding, she wobbled into the courtyard. Worship, worshippers let her pass, and despite her funereal colors, she seemed unperturbed. No, she seemed gentle, easy, as if hopeful. She and my aunt exchanged words and tendernesses, 
before Mariam stroked her face. Then Missé seemed to glide across the grounds and into her, uh, into her rusticated home. I, I wept. In my chambers, I wept openly. I wept for the future I would not have with this love, with my son. And I wept again out of happiness for the world my son would inherit, for a world in which he had Miss A for a mother and a well from which to sip, a well that his true father had named, a world in which asylum was not a thing that the faithful had to pursue, but was ever present, a spiritual immaterial tenement. And of course, a world that would rid itself of Missourians. Never think that the Lord is unaware of what the wrongdoers do, I thought. I awaited moonrise and plotted my course to the transverse road, the thoroughfare that used that th the thoroughfare used to drive cattle from the western cantons of our state to the eastern markets. To mask the familiar contrivance of my face, I pulled the blade from my, from my pack and denuded myself. A charcoal wool plumped atop my aunt's illustrated holy book. My face felt scraped, descaled, born anew into this savage world. I am content with the Lord's protection to myself, I whispered, but the words failed to placate me. As was their nightly duty, two clothed women sh shut the mosque gates in, against the panhandlers who hunkered outside. The rifle-toting sluggards who called themselves sentries would soon be asleep. Never underestimate the slop of men who believe their sect victorious. And the world outside my window, fruit bats quivered and shrieked, which to this day is a sound that once haunting and heartwarming for me. I knew it was time. To get to Colorado, I tramped across our land like an unshod ascetic and shrouded in the tatters of a woman's cloak. I kept sight of a transverse, but sought co copses when I could. The sodden country calmed my abused souls, but the friendly and becoming waves of prairie grasses entranced my weary spirit. After devouring my provisions in a friendly feast, I chomped on insects, wild grapes, trapped an enfeebled, bushy-tailed squirrel, and refilled my gourd from the creeks that baptized the state. And once, I did witness them, the terrorists, the irregulars, the Missourians. The story was as follows. I had encountered a meadow, meadow path and witnessing no herd or cattlemen thought to follow it into a shrouded forest. Although I could decry no bats, what a pleasure it was to discover a woodland so similar to the one near the minaret. But my ardor soon abated as a scent like soured milk accosted me. Then I heard a bleeding and I recall, recalled our familiar herd. I thought to ambush these wandering beasts and slit their throats, tasks at which I was adept. I deployed furtive measures, maneuvering from tree to tree, circumventing fallen branches lest a careless footfall scatter the quarry. As I arrived, the bleeding transformed into what might be called speech. A pair of grizzled longhairs dismembered a pack animal of a sort and yelped at each other. Could one even call this yapping language? It summoned in my memory a derelict version of the tongue in which my cousin and the imam preached, but I suspected that any elder would find hardship traced parsing the dialogue between these patriarchs. Their rifles were planted in front of them like flagposts, and from one draped a battered, a battered triband flag. I thought on the seasoned Jayhawker fanatics who would beseech the imam for assistance in the idle time before we suffered the sensations of my cousin and my aunt. A bold action in my arms was prudent to have on this journey, and as Missourians were known cowards, any advantage in an altercation with these men was mine, undoubtedly. Plus, I had the Lord's name, and he would act to safeguard my person from these non-believers. And so, with memory of the Jayhawker fanatics, I rushed to the rifles, and they rushed to me, and I scored the decorated instrument. Missourians, I roared, I bring you slaughter. I leveled the weapon at these terrorists, although the flag drooped below the barrel, as if I were a celebrated member of their tribe. Call me Quantrill if you must. Little shalt thou laugh and much shalt thou weep, I hollered, mimicking a line from a sermon I had heard my cousin give. The men peered from between the shanks of the camel they had been dismantling. You couldn't see their eyes from the gore on their faces. One raised his arms in surrender, as I had expected, exposing his tobacco-stained teeth, and the other, after glancing my way, returned to butchery. We remained in this pose until the butcher carved a hunk from the shank and pre presented it to me. He had not known it, but he aped my own machinations. The crippled butcher of Kansas is what they had called me. Unsure of this Missourian deception, but certain of my appetite, 
I inched toward his outstretched appendage with the rifle raised. I snatched the meat from him and fled with the weapon in my pack. I huffed from the abominable scene until I confronted a clearing in which to raise a fire and roast the meat. The rifle was cumbersome, and like my love, Miss A stouter than I had suspected. After ravaging the tough meat, I slung the bolt open on the instrument. To my consternation, it was barren. I had been no more than a sluggard leveling it at those bushwhackers and had done them a service by absconding with this hefty impotence. I buried the weapon right then and there to sequester it from those carrying munitions. Rain came by way of the vault, and I scattered back into the forest until I encountered what I thought was a ghastly and haggard house, slots failing, windows sagging. There was a breach in the crown of this habitation, but like he had with Hajar and Ishmael in the uncultivated valley, the Lord had provided. I scaled a trampled fence and across a field of stones that fractured underfoot like skullcaps, but a padlocked doorway forestalled by admission. Invited by the windows that framed the entrance, I wrapped my hand in my cloak, smashed a pane, and crawled inside to find not a habitation for man, but one for the Lord. For what I had entered was a decrepit church. The pews were befouled, but was what was more disconcerting, the belfry had crashed inside and the bell had clobbered a pastor. The collar that read Garrett still cho choked his still smirking skeleton. I shooed away varmints that had nested in his sand-colored hair, which despite the lack of a spirit still retained its hue. The pastor's remains remind, recalled, recalled those of an animal thing that I was sure I had never seen. In a gulp, I emptied my gourd and set it to refill under a trickle of rainwater. With my sage, unmoving companion, I rested in this counterfeit ossuary, harvesting what I could from the creepers, the vermin, and the vegetation that had taken up worship. Fruit bats shrieked and roosted in an oak outside. That I had escaped one so-called house of worship for the dispiriting confines of another was not lost on me. Though the bats, they were reassuring. Was our land so wrecked by conflagrations that sanctuaries were more prevalent than homesteads? And what were the once lives of these parishioners? Where were their habitations? Where had they fled? I had heard, I had caught hearsay that these faiths had once teemed with adherents, but who abided by sooty histories overheard in coffee houses? Many of our people, that was who. I overturned a pew and laid beneath it, unwilling to cede an opportunity to sleep indoors. Would that I had had a bedroll in which to lay my unmucked head. But as I had done before, I woke to clamor and calamity. Brothers harangued the walls of my shelter, casing the unhallowed church. Their torches scared shadows inside that loomed above my terrified person like a coven of gins. From my position beneath the pew, the brothers seemed again to be atop me. The report the report of rifles set a roosting owl fight, and the rattle of the doorway's chains, I thought, would be enough to wake the dreaming pastor. I could hear the brothers outside as they harangued one another and argued about whether to enter or just set the place ablaze. I fingered the page from my aunt's holy book and laid as still as a corpse, praying that they would not, that they could not. I imagined the brother with darkened lenses, the flames dancing in his eyes. My breath left me as the brothers set their torches on the church. The fire lit the facade and smoke began to crowd the nave, nearly bullying me from my hideout and into their uncharitable embrace. And my prayer, yet again responsed by the Lord. A timely downpour both quenched the flame and the aspiring intruders. The Lord, as was his wont, sent a deluge. And with it, the brothers' mayhem receded until I could once again heed the bats. I remained under the pure in its vicinity for at least another day. When finally I ready to quit the sanctuary such that it was, I saw that a raven nested on the window through which I had entered, and a spider's web thick as clotted milk concealed the shattered pane. I thought it best to undisturb these protecting machinations and pried a rear window open, using a large cross as a makeshift crowbar. I made my way back to the transverse in Pastor Garrett's boots, the Lord be praised. When the brothers finally apprehended me, I had been inhabiting a spider hole on Scabra's former farmland in the valley of the Kansan Southwest. On the horizon, the blue rocks stabbed dutifully at the sky. They seemed to defy the laws such as they are of the natural world. Would that I had had a chance to savor that luscious snow. Near the fortified border, I heard the Colorado grindsmen grind rounds into the cannons. The discharge from their munitions wafted to my subterranean hideaway, and with their rifles, they burst apart barking rodents a deadly lot with their aim, and never were my meals so plentiful or sulfurous. 
Buzzards in great numbers, in great numbers circled low, but in the evenings, I rolled open the skin of sod that secreted my underground cave and hunched to the ground like a picker was savory ineffable cotton to retrieve these beheaded squirrels and groundhogs, staining my hands with gore as I tore their bellies and slurped down their paltry meat and briny livers, which were, I am unashamed to admit, a delicacy to one inert to a diet of pestic berries. One forenoon, as I willed my claws in the gloom of my hole, the world above me thundered and shook. Rain came by way of dirt. My habitation started collapsing. Did I fear being interred before my time? I did. Was it Missourians? Miners? Brothers? No. As the trembling subsided, hooves tore through the sod. The shank of an ungulate dropped into my habitation, habit, uh, dropped into my habitat, and fail, flailed and kicked before the resolute beast sprung himself from my unwitting trap. And after him, I scampered into the daylight. A pack of camels, the wild horde, galloped across the scrub. They stopped to pick at the remains of a rodent. The camp scattered them, but I had seen them. The untamed camels of well, mission and husbandry. A new life could be inaugurated by harnessing these beasts. But while I fantasized about taming camels and riding them across the border, the brothers explored. They suffered luxuries that in my hunted condition I was not afforded. They traveled by daylight. They were not garbed in clothing or ordained for women. They did not rely on rodents for sustenance. I was kneeling as if in prayer when they breached my seclusion. Cursed daylight streamed in, followed by a brother who pothered up a dust cloud and landed inside. Other goons fell in behind him. I wish I could say that from this point, I was luminary. My blade, gaunt and rusted, rested atop my pack. I shot off the floor, nullifying my prayers, snatched the instrument, and then charged into the nearest brother, slipping the knife into his flank. The boy cried out, and his mirrored hat toppled as he contorted oh, my successful assault. The brother behind him squawked. We bring greetings from your aunt. I recognized him as the oversized one, the pretend lieutenant who retained the darkened lenses. I grabbed the bloody blade from the fellow I had stabbed and made slashing motions. Death to bandits, I shouted. The bespectacled brother inquired about the page from my aunt's holy book, but I refused to relinquish it. He then crashed the butt of his rifle into my forehead. To him we belong, and to him we shall return. Thank you. Thank you, Farouk. Um, our last reader for the night is Peter Klein. Uh, Peter is a former Wallace Stegner Fellow and Merrill House and Clampett House resident. He teaches writing at the University of San Francisco and in Stanford University's Master of Liberal Arts program. He's the author of two poetry collections, Deviants um, from S SFASU Press and Miraforms, which was published by Parlor Press Free Verse Editions in the fall of 2019. Uh, please welcome Peter. Thanks so much, Lee, and uh, thank you, Marco and Gorilla Lit and uh, Dixon Place and all of you uh, for coming out tonight. It's great to be here. Um, I'm going to be reading poems from my new collection. Just came out a couple months ago. That's called Mirror Forms, um, and uh, the the basic idea of the collection is that. Um, all the poems in the collection are, are built around a single form. Um, it's a form I invented, so it's kind of like a sonnet, but um, a little bit different in a couple ways. The most prominent thing you'll notice is that the first and last line repeat, they're, they're the same. Um, all the poems I'm going to read tonight are monologues, so um, kind of taking on the voice of different characters, and these brief little poems just kind of give you a snapshot into their, into their brains. Um, so without any further ado, this first one is called um, The Living Dead, and this is a poem about uh, I'm staying up uh, much too late at night watching TV, The Living Dead. Asleep with the light left on, I dream in animation. I'm a zombie porno station. Grub worms binge on the lawn. Someone left the dog on and it died. It's on vacation. We're all flying 
toward that nation, asleep with the light left on. This next poem is called Procrastinator, um, and it has a kind of a biblical reference in here. It, it kind of calls attention to the moments um, in the Bible where Christ um, goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray um, just before the soldiers come to take him away before the crucifixion. Um, so this is Procrastinator. It's later than it was when Christ slipped off to pray. I was asleep that day. Tonight, I'm wired. No doze is not my favorite buzz, but the shaking makes me double. There's a corpse at the kitchen table. It's later than it was. And this poem is called Shapeshifter. Whenever I want, I change. I can't be made to fix. X equals X. Relax while I do this brain exchange. I binge at Buffet Strange. What begins in little inklings ends in new beginnings. Whenever I want, I change. And this one's called Narcissist. A different difficulty from each day's mirror test. Which way do I look best? Might make my thoughts more pretty. Self-study breeds self-pity. Give me the will to choose a less exacting muse a different difficulty. And this poem's called Theorist, as in conspiracy theorist. Um, this has a, a word that's kind of strange to hear out loud. Um, it's also controversially pronounced. I usually say GIF. Some people say GIF. I'm not going to get into the controversy. Um, you'll hear the word. Uh, this is Theorist. There is no private browsing. Unidentified ogles the FBI, ogling your carousing. Disgusting, but arousing. GIFs you've long since trashed still infiltrate your head cache. There is no private browsing. And this one's called Cat Collar. Um, this kind of starts a series of, of poems where I get into some darker perspectives. Um, so this is a, about somebody wolf whistling on the street. Cat Collar. I do it to myself and not because I can't help it. I make my lips a pulpit and testify the wolf. Of course, I prefer pelf, but that likes soft cell tactics. My gift is autocratics. I do it to myself. This poem's called Opportunist. Um, it pulls a, its repeating line um, from an Elliott Smith song, Pizzola, um, but makes a pretty different use of it, I, I hope. Um, this is opportunist. Give up the thing you love, but keep it in your sight. Follow it home at night. From a shadowy alcove, watch as one calfskin glove slips off to withdraw a key. Then it goes inside with me. Give up the thing you love. And this poem's called Visionary. 
I see what's almost there. Shaped gap in a thought with a sex in the statesman's obit, cracks in the exosphere. Let rubberneckers stare at the fur the killer wore, the flash of flesh at the tear. I see what's almost there. Um, and this poem's called Apostate. Um, this makes reference to a kind of tradition in the Sufi poets um, of referring to a kind of um, divine visitation as the guest. Um, and uh, it kind of pulls a line from Emily Dickinson as, as well. Um, this is apostate. It might be easier to make the door more strict, double the doorman, act at the contracted hour as though no one were here, grow quaintly derelict with no guest to evict. It might be easier. And this poem is called Worrier. Um, it uses a kind of uh, old fashioned name for, for solitaire, which is patience. Um, and so this poem is Worrier. I know what it must be, but I can't bear to check. Playing patience with a short deck, counting back from infinity until it's time to see that no one hid. I've heard even God has a safety word. I know what it must be. Uh, and just four more poems to finish up here. This poem's called Impetuous. This is a poem about writing. Um, probably the closest of all these to, uh, to my own personal perspective. Impetuous. It takes so fucking long. There's no time left to live. Just as I slip a groove, I'm cueing some new song and the beat goes dark. The bang dangles on the buck. One line drags three weeks slack. It takes so fucking long. The next monologue here is called Futurists. Um, and I live in San Francisco. This is a, a poem uh, about tech optimism and, and what sometimes seems like tech over optimism. Mm -hmm. um, this poem's Futurist. Death was just something to do. Nothing was something to feel. Only the android was real. God was all zeros and twos. Now, we wake up with a bruise in the shape like the morning before. Permafrost weeps like a sore. Death is still something to do. And this one's called Skeptic, uh, this is a poem about climate change. It happened anywhere. As engineers played bridge and Noah hit the fridge and gave his dog away. Me, I was on the freeway, ice in my glass. I knew what a trumped up sun could do. It happened anyway. And the last poem is called Flirt. Do you have time for me out of your unweighed portion? A grain, a gram's transgression against eternity? 
next Saturday, I'm free for a transgression session after your due devotions. Do you have time for me? Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Um, I want to thank all of our great readers, uh, Peter, Farouk, and Nicole. Um, all of their books are for sale. Um, if you that. Um, so what we've done these last couple of gorillas, we've opened it up for a Q and A. If anybody has any questions, you can type it in the chat, and I'll read it out, or you can just ask directly. Um, or if you just want to talk about books in general for a little bit, we can do that as well. Um, so yeah, if anybody has, let's see if anybody, nobody has left a question. Okay. Um, well, all right, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask them. So um, this is sort of one that's voted every one. Um, really just, I mean, how has, how has these last few months impacted just your writing in general? Have you found it a time to be sort of profound and get a lot done, or has it been uh, to get work done. For me, it's been hard. Uh, you know, it's it, I've been better the last month or something like that. But at the beginning, I feel like, like most people, maybe um, I was just kind of shell shocked and you know, trying to get through the days. So you know, it's been, you know, as it's become more normal, it's been better. But, um, but yeah, it's. A lot of a lot of time at home, but that didn't translate necessarily to productive time, at least at the beginning. Sure, sure. Um, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought, I think there was a moment where I thought maybe this would somehow be more productive. And I have to say, the first month was hard. I really struggled with not being able to find the time and actually focus. And to be honest, I kind of just gave up. And ever since giving up, or at least uh, agreeing to cede control uh, of that kind of time, uh, I feel much better. I've been doing a lot more reading. Um, I've just, you know, things are starting to now come back in terms of writing. There's a new project that I was really excited to start working on that's, that kind of comes out of this book. And um, I had kind of done all the preliminary research and. I, I was at that stage where I was transitioning from like doing more research into writing and then this happened and it kind of blew up those plans. Um, and so seating control of that, um, seating control of what I thought my creative process would be and what it usually is to uh, just not doing that uh, has made me feel better. And I think I'm finally kind of coming out of that uh, stage of really feeling frustrated by it. And, and now, now, you know, just, putting it out of my mind and reading interesting stuff that I had picked up that I wouldn't have read otherwise. So, I mean, I think that's important. Like it's, I mean, to make yourself feel guilty on top of everything else that's going on. I mean, that, that's sort of just self torture. Um, and like you said, maybe sort of a, a new strategy in terms of how you tackle writing winds up coming out of it. Um, and I don't know, to like let the muse find you when it finds you sort of, I think. Um, this is the best advice. Um, we have a question from uh, Von Garrett to everyone. Um, oh, actually, no, it's to Peter. Um, can you talk about a little about your process for the new collection? How long did it take you to write and edit? Sure, uh, about six years, um, which when you break it down by line, um, it's kind of, of scene it seems like sometimes because um, the all the poems are only eight, eight lines long um, but it's writing them was a very painstaking and slow process um, and so the writing and editing kind of happened simultaneously it wasn't uh, most of them by the time they were complete they were kind of edited because they went through kind of many transformations over the over the course of writing them, but it didn't kind of just spring right out. Um, it, it took a while to get there, but um, but yeah, so about six years total. Um, anyone else? Yeah, Farouk. Well, so I feel like the elephant in the room is, Nicole, what did you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, well, the only thing I can say really is that what I, I think it was in November that I actually posted about this virus in on Facebook that was happening in China. And I was like, posted it going, look at this funny little thing that's like kind of got a connection to my book. And I thought it would be like this funny thing. And it ended up being obviously not funny, yeah. not funny and like way worse. Um, so once it started like really happening, I was like, obviously way more paranoid than the average person because I just wrote a book about this exact thing happening. And I was like, oh my God, are all these things going to happen? You know, I had no idea what would feasibly happen and uh, honestly like we had a different government in my book when I was writing it than we do now so that sucks um but no I mean I was at work and the minute any little thing came up I would go to my bosses and be like we need to work from home now and everyone kind of acted like I was making too much out of it and then one day everyone was like oops just kidding you're right and now we're all from home so I think at the most, after writing that book, I, I just reacted stronger to this happening than most people did. And that was good because I, I, my whole thinking was, you know what, I would rather be safe than sorry. So I'm just going to isolate myself. And I started stockpiling food, like not hoarding food, but like me and my niece were picking up extra stuff every time, weeks before anybody else. Um, I just took it way more serious than everybody else was at the time because of writing that book. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, it ended up serving me well, so that's about it. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because a lot of times people look towards, like, nonfiction writers for advice about things, but in terms of fiction writers, like, sometimes you do just as much research on a project, if not even more, than necessarily for a nonfiction book, yeah. and you are a little bit of an authority on <laughs> with the average person because of the amount that you put into it. Um, so I'm sorry that people thought you were crazy before. Well, and the funny thing is, is that, um, like, I think one of the most things I researched was viruses and how they work. And I was very lucky that my best friend that I grew up with um, is a biologist um, by trade. And so she made the virus for me. So she and I have been chatting through all of this. And I was like, hey, what do you think about this? Is this something I should be worried about? And she was like, uh, yeah, be worried. And I, when she told me that, I was like, yeah. But then it was like all this other information that I had researched for months about viruses and how they can mutate, how they pass from one another. and all of the, all of that just was stuck in my head and I couldn't think about anything else. So I think that's another reason why I just like kind of overreact. Well, now it's not overreacting, but at the time, yeah, at the time everyone thought I was overreacting, but I was just like, I cannot get this information out of my head. So I'm sorry if I'm overreacting, but I'm going to do it. So her thoughts now for like where we're headed, if, if you've spoken to her uh my my friend who created the virus um you know she actually thinks her family got it because she was telling me about a, a time in in february so she she's not as concerned about the version that we have here now she's more concerned about the versions that are mutating in china and hong kong that she's been reading about and they're deadlier and have different side effects and she's like obviously this virus is mutating which i figured that it would and I figured that she thought that it would really mutate here that she's seeing it mutate there and she's worried about that one coming over it also could mutate in a completely different way here mm -hmm. I mean they're just the nature of viruses is they work to survive and to kill so whatever it's got to do to do that it's going to try to do um so she's not concerned right now because they're we're all still quarantining and she's in California um but she's just concerned about the mutated versions. Sure. Well, just for us. <laughs> um, we have a question from Linda um, Heidemann, uh, and she had a similar question to you, Nicole, um, that Farouk asked. Uh, but her other question is to Peter. Uh, what was your inspiration for Mirror Forms? Um, sure, yeah. Um... Well, I've always been interested in, in form and poetry um, and also in, in sound and music. That's um, kind of um, the musical aspect of, of poems is always to me one of the most important things. And so about, it was about 2012, I think I wrote my first one of these. It actually, it's actually in my first book. 
Um, and I wrote it as a one-off um, just to kind of play around with a particular sound that I was going for and didn't plan to write any more. And then um, all of a sudden I found myself writing another one and another one and I just started to get really, I think interested is one word, but obsessed is probably what it was really happening. Um, and I just started to kind of think about all the different kinds of music I could make with it and all the different kinds of things I could say with it. And um, yeah, I, I wrote almost nothing else um, for, for those six years while I was kind of under that spell. So it's, to me, it's something about the, the musical quality of it that um, inspired me most and, and just the kind of curiosity about it. Um, we have a question also from Linda for Farouk. Um, how did the political climate in this country affect your writing or did it? Yeah, uh, actually, thank you for asking that question. Um, it definitely did. And, you know, the, the short answer is, um, you know, I had the, I was living in New York uh, for a while before September 11th hit and I was living in lower Manhattan. And um, having grown up in the Midwest in Kansas, like I said, um, there was a certain need, I think, for me to um, escape uh, my identity or the obvious confines of my identity. Not that Kansas was necessarily that bad at the time that I was growing up. I think in ways it's uh, the Midwest is probably the South have gotten measurably worse. But in, in any case, um, I was living in lower Manhattan and I had just started my MFA in fiction uh, in New York when September 11th hit. And it was so interesting to have that, interesting is not the right word, it was kind of terrible actually to have that pre-September 11th, post-September 11th um, New York City uh, uh, feel. And, you know, a lot of the things that I thought I could escape, um, you know, my skin color and my gender um, being the two primary ones um, were really thrown back into my face by New Yorkers. Um, everywhere that I went in the city post September 11th, you know, uh, uh, the, I, I could go on, but, but so having just started an MFA um, under those conditions, um, I think I, I, I used the, the, the character of the narrator, um, although the passage that I read may make him seem sympathetic, he's kind of a terrible person. Um, he's not kind of a terrible person, he's a terrible person. Um, and I think um, a lot of what I tried to do through this character was process a lot of the um, hate that was projected on me into making this character a terrible person. Like, what if you kind of took this um, uh, projection that's been forced on you and then like just make a character out of it? And, I, and so it really helped me, I think in ways process, but also in ways that made me feel shitty um, to do. But um, I think overall it helped in the political climate in this country certainly uh, affected it in that sense. And then of course, over time, you know, that has changed. I think one of the most interesting statistics that I have read is that um, specific terrorist incidents that happen on American soil, like San Bernardino, the San Bernardino shootings or whatever, committed by Muslims in particular, uh, or people that say they're Muslims. Um, uh, uh, don't necessarily get, uh, don't necessarily engender the amount of reprisal and hate against, um, you know, Muslims in this country, as does um, actually the speech coming from the top. So when a lot of the, um, um, a lot of the Muslim ban stuff was happening from Trump, you saw more hate directed towards Muslims in this country than you did from actual terrorist incidents that, that happened in this country. So, you know, you still see it ongoing and it's still kind of there in the background. Thank you for that question. Um, so we have a request. I don't know if we, I'm not sure if this could be done. Um, from Casey Traumer who asked, can we see a poem on the page, please? I don't handle the tech stuff. Um, I don't know, can we do that, Marco? I'm not sure. Um, I don't know, Peter, can you hold up a... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think we, we don't have the poems to like just. Yeah, I don't have like. Uh, the solution is buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be backwards, I think. So. Here we go. That works. That works. It's a basic idea. Yeah, yeah. It's looking good. Little Sanders. Thank you. Um, are there any last questions before we? 
close it out for the night. Um, okay. Um, again, I want, oh, oh, somebody just said thanks for grading. <laughs> um, uh, so please pick up all three readers' books um, if you're interested. Um, a huge thanks to all of them for reading. Everybody did such a great job. Uh, big thanks to Dixon Place as well for putting up with us and for uh, keeping us on even in these virtual times. Um, you could support them on the link below. Um, any bit helps at kind of any institution right now to stay afloat, um, especially you know, here in New York City where um, things have been so great. Um, and as of now, we'll be back in September. Whether that will be in person or virtually, we shall see. Uh, but no matter what, we will be back. So uh, you can look forward to that. And again, uh, thanks and hope everybody has a great night. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Peter. Bye.